number of questions. Uh, is NIST the right place to be looking at cybersecurity for the smart grid, or should it be the Department of Defense or the telecom industry research engineers? And then in a related question that Eric may want to weigh in on as well, in your opinion, do the NIST cybersecurity and NERC CIP standards align with each other? I'll take the first one, Jesse, you know, and I'm not speaking for Duke Energy, but I think NIST is the, the what I see is getting the most traction. You know, uh, I think taking a look at the NIST IR7628 and kind of working through some of the processes of overlaying your specific architecture and, and identifying your interfaces and looking at the 400 plus security requirements that are in there, uh, I think that's, I don't think you can hurt anything. And in my opinion, for how that whole regulatory industry stands right now, I think that's the best time spent. Eric, I, I would agree with what Rob said as well. As far as, you know, do they align, I think that they're somewhat complementary, but NERC SIP is coming out with a version 4 soon, which is going to be quite a bit different than it has been and will likely opt in other critical cyber assets as a result of the risk-based assessments that need to be performed. So I think there's more to come there, but I, I do think that NIST is probably one of the best sources there is to help guide. What Rob said is also important. It, it, you know, think of it as a guide. It doesn't mean that everything is applicable to you, but it should spur the type of critical thinking you need to be successful. I had several people, Eric, with similar questions about asking, are there any independent labs that offer services to assess security, of, or are there places where you can get tools independent of the vendors? If you don't want to rely on the vendor's own tools, or are there lists of reputable testing firms? A number of questions along those lines. Yeah, so there are, and I'm not advertising for Accenture, but this is the kind of work that we do and other consultancies do as well. Some of the defense contractors also have some of this capability and are particularly good at, you know, some of the areas I mentioned before about decompiling code and looking for inherent risks in the code itself. So, yes. Okay, great. Now, there are several questions, and I'll kind of read them because they all seem to be around a similar concept. Do you think that AMI meters should be connected directly to the utility or maybe through a separate gateway or uh, sitting on a separate server with just access via middleware? Uh, like a similar question, should smart meter data be separated from utility enterprise and operations networks via an air gap, quote unquote? And finally, do you think that the hand, the home area network, should be physically separated from the external network meter to utility? Any thoughts on that? Rob, you want to go and then I'll weigh in. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Well, um, there's a lot of a lot of question there, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of question there. You know, and I mean, from a security standpoint, I think we'd all love air gaps. You know, that'd be awesome. It would make our jobs a lot easier. But from a business standpoint, I don't know with with the data and the the uses and and all this integration that's going around on pan meter electric vehicles. Um, there's just a wide range of of equipment that. I think the goal of the future is to hope you know, integrate all that to, to provide the customer with the best experience. I don't know if we can separate it from enterprise IT. It, it's, that's just my opinion. Yeah, so I guess I would agree with that. In order to get some of the benefits and gains that we're expecting here requires greater interconnectivity. I'd also contend that many utility companies, well, I would say that AMI or smart meter is um, out ahead of smart grid. But in looking towards the smart grid implementation, they're looking at dual purposing the network that's used to gather smart meter information for smart grid information as well. So I think it's our responsibility as security practitioners to be able to provide and evolve uh, the maturity of the security so that we can realize the business benefits and gains that we're anticipating. One of our listeners asks is if it's important to have a CISO or a CSO chief security officer to get this stuff right. My point of view would be it certainly helps for the organization that we talked about governance and steering committees to have a senior level person that has responsibility overall for these kinds of things. It established the fact that it's important for the organization, that it's a critical part of the business, and it will be even more so into the future. Yeah, I think that's a great point that Eric makes, and I'll follow that up by saying I've never seen from a security standpoint, I think SmartGrid has so much visibility for the security of data and from the media. 
I would say that most of your executives at the company are really keyed into that at this point, more so than, than I've ever seen. They're very sensitive to those topics. I have a listener ask how you can confirm that all of those AMI meters out there in the field haven't been compromised, you know, with patched firmware or infected with malware. Uh, he's wondering and worrying if that happens on a wide enough scale that it could uh, create some problems. This is Rob. I would say, Jesse, that uh, it, it's just a, it's doing that due diligence and testing that AMI meter and, and recognizing its vulnerabilities and knowing that implementing controls like network segmentation and you know intrusion detection systems, having a clear understanding of your vulnerabilities and, and working with the vendor to fix those vulnerabilities is really the only way you're going to get any kind of comfort to know that those things can or can't happen. So there's no a way, obviously, to test each and every one of those one at a time, so you've got to kind of rely on that type of approach. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, but you also have to know the product. I mean, you have to know if, if they are vulnerable, if that can happen, if they can talk to one another. You know, just knowing the architecture really goes a long way to understanding where your vulnerabilities lie. This is, Jesse, this also ties into my comments previously on supply chain. So agree with everything that Rob said, and it is know your vendor, know their manufacturing processes, know how they are protecting those mechanisms through it, and test. Okay. Now we have uh, one a question about what kind of protections uh, utilities can write into contracts with third-party uh, providers. And we also had a comment separately from another listener said that service level agreements with meter vendors can be helpful So uh, for patching and security updates. So can you help us, Eric, a little bit in terms of uh, are there contract provisions that should be part of your overall security blanket? Uh, so absolutely. Um, I am not an attorney. However, I have just come through some you know, fairly lengthy contract negotiations, and all the utility companies that we're working with have uh, requirements for NERC SIP protection, have security incident response requirements. So it, it's absolutely becoming an inherent part of any, any contract that's going to touch any of these components in the utility. I also have a question if you, either of you have seen vendors take action to correct vulnerabilities that may have been raised in some of these past presentations at places like Black Hat, DEF CON, and those kinds of things. Are they stepping up to the plate and, and fixing these things that have been spotted? So I think they're generally responsive. I mean, this is their business, and they, you can't afford to lose integrity in the marketplace and be a successful business, so you have to take action. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, Jesse. I, I think that now in this environment, these vendors, they fix their stuff you know, fairly quickly. At least that's been our experience. Well, what are but none of our vendors penalties? have ever had any problems. So. <laughs> <laughs> what are the penalties in the contracts for, for noncompliance, typically? What kind of clauses? Uh, it depends on what's negotiation uh, negotiated around limitations of liability and what potential sanctions are uh, may be imposed. So it's really up to the the individual business. But I, I've seen asked, some where there's no limitation on liability. So. Uh, a listener asked to what extent legacy requ systems require specialized testing tools or specialized skills. Are they harder to keep secure? Are they harder to test and? Uh, I definitely think they're harder. Some of these legacy devices were created before any of these, these security concerns really bubbled up or even before the Internet was prevalent. So definitely there is issues with legacy equipment. All the security controls you know, need to be validated. I guess the only thing I'd add in is that legacy is a pretty broad term. And so when you look at legacy operational equipment, so things that are part of the Energy Control Center, for example, uh, where there's some fairly unique communication protocol still in place. I think there are special tools or at least processes and skills that are necessary there dealing with SCADA and remote terminal units and the components that connect them. Um, if it's legacy into the back office where you're dealing with you know, an enterprise service bus, meter data management, uh, customer information system, outage management system, I think more traditional methods in, that are available and have been available are applicable. One listener asked if mesh communications pose greater risks than point-to-point? -point. I don't see any greater The protocol actually has some pretty neat security stuff in it. And some okay. built-in resiliency. All right. Okay. That's fair enough. And we had a question.
question about, uh, well, two that are somewhat related. One, you know, does telecom have anything to offer our industry? And are there any promising new technologies that are showing up that people should be sure to take a look at? I have a quick answer. So if the answer is yes. So the telecom industry has been dealing with complex event processing for a while, and this is definitely complex event processing when you're looking at millions of different data points, you know, a relatively short period of time and needing to do the appropriate level of analytics uh, and correlation in order to really understand what it means to the successful operation of your system just from a reliability standpoint as well as from a security standpoint. Where we have drawn from is in the telecom industry around complex event processing. Uh, we have someone asking, and this will probably have to be our last question. This gentleman is, that, is curious about attacks not from the sort of malicious centralized thing, hacking the whole system, but for energy theft and kind of at the user level. They might hack their smart meters or smart, smart appliances to manipulate consumption data uh, by modifying the firmware, for example. And it, it does a utility need to be verifying that all the firmware on their smart devices has not been hacked? Can the devices be remotely disabled if they discover a problem? So I have a yeah. couple of quick comments. So energy theft is one of the advantages of smart meter in a way to detect and prevent energy theft. A unique thought on that, there's some provinces in Canada that have thriving marijuana operations and where there's quite a bit of energy theft um, in order to hide those marijuana grow operations. And the concerns there are then the security mechanisms that need to be in place to thwart large illegal business that would be seeking to circumvent those protections. So I think that's kind of interesting on a, taking that energy theft to a broader scale. But yeah, it's, a, it's always a concern, but it's also one of the benefits we think that we're going to um, get out of AMI or smart meter. I'd like to follow that up by saying that's, that's one of the pen testing profiles that we use is energy theft. So you know, from your risk assessment, having your testers take a look at the devices for just those type of vulnerabilities is, is really important. Thank you. The only thing left for me is to say a very sincere thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rob, as well, for, for your time and generosity. And thank you for joining us. Please uh, watch Smart Grid News for the announcement of our next Lessons from the Real World webinar. I hope to see you here soon. Yeah.